So some of you may remember that last year I read a book series called Guards of the Shadowlands, and that was written by a woman named Sarah Fine. And I thought Guards of the Shadowlands was pretty good. You know, not perfect. It had some issues, especially in the later part of the series and the final book. Like, it, it did go downhill quite a bit, but overall, really enjoyed it, and I just immediately decided I wanted to see more from that author. And so a couple months later, uh, when I was canceling my Audible subscription, <laughs> because, I don't know, I'm not getting into all the drama surrounding that lately, but I just decided I wanted to cancel it, and I used my last three credits to buy another series by Sarah Fine, which is called Servants of Fate, and um, I kind of regret that, because <laughs> this series, it is kind of similar in some ways, like it does deal with the afterlife and stuff, but it is very, very different in other ways, and overall, I just was not very into it. This is the introduction song. It's not very good, but it's not too long. Now, when I say that both series are similar, I mean they both deal with the afterlife, although they do it in very different ways, and they both have a pretty big focus on romance, although it's much, much bigger in Servants of Fate than in Guards of the Shadowlands, and other than that, they are pretty different. Like, Guards of the Shadowlands was young adults, and Servants of Fate is very much an adult romance series. Like, yeah, I'll be real with you, it's just straight-up erotica. But I did not know that it was going to be straight-up erotica when reading, and if I had known that, I would not have read it, because that was one of my bigger problems with it, but, I mean, I had already bought all of them by the time I realized this, so I just powered on through, and here we are. So the story is about a couple of different things, but at the beginning, it is about these, these two siblings, adult siblings, named Eli and Galena, who moved to Boston from Pittsburgh. Galena has been offered a job at a university where she's going to do research on viruses and vaccines and stuff, and Eli has managed to get a job as an EMT there. And they don't have any other family, it's just the two of them, that's why they're sticking together. And also, they're from Pittsburgh, which is a desert wasteland in this world. And at first, I thought this was meant to be like a fantasy version of our world. You know, because they go to Boston, and that is flooded. It's like Venice, you know, instead of streets, it has canals and stuff. So I thought, okay, this is like a, a parallel universe or some shit. Uh, and again, Pittsburgh is a desert, which it isn't in real life. So I was just thinking they were doing something with that. But no, it just turns out it's actually the future. Like this is decades from now, may maybe around 100 years. And just climate change has gotten a lot worse, so like, the ocean levels have risen and flooded some areas, but then other areas have gotten a lot drier, and places are hotter, and like, the world is really a mess. Now, meanwhile, while they're doing this, we are also learning about how the afterlife works in this world uh, through the eyes of a character named Casey. Now, Casey is a member of the fairy family, and that's fairy as in, like, a boat. It, it's not spelled like the little dudes with wings, you know? Uh, and the fairies, they run this company called Psychopomps, and the Psychopomps Corporation runs the afterlife. Like, uh, basically the way it works is that, uh, the fates, you know, like from Greek myth, the fates, uh, have a loom where they weave out everyone's lives and everything, and when, uh, when it comes to the point where someone's supposed to die, they tell this guy named Jason Moros, who is, like, a god of death, he's, he's, the brother of the Sisters of Fate, uh, and he is in charge of these creatures called the Kier, who are basically the souls of dead people. Like, like when they die, they're either going to go to heaven or hell, depending on how they, uh, how they lived. Uh, although most of them are probably going to hell, because the only way you can become a Kier is if you have killed somebody before. Uh, and yeah, Moros goes up to him and says, hey, you can go to the afterlife, or you can work for me, and be my servant, and you will live forever. And a lot of them take him up on that deal. And the Kier, when someone is fated to die, they go up to him and they mark them. And when they do that, it means they're going to die soon, but it also, that's how the Kier, the, the Kier choose how they die. So they can choose to let them die violently or peacefully in their sleep or of a heart attack or, you know, things like that. And then after they die, a fairy is supposed to be nearby so that they can take their soul and send it to the afterlife, either heaven or hell, depending on how they lived. And when they send a soul through a portal to the afterlife, some coins pop out, like actual gold afterlife coins, and so the fairy, <clears throat> the fairies and the Kier both get paid for that. 
like they, they actually go into a little bit of detail about how the Psychopomps Corporation will melt down coins and turn them into gold bars, and then they have, also have to launder all the money and everything. It's like, it's kind of interesting, you know? They don't go into a whole lot of detail about it, but it's clear that the author thought about that sort of thing and how this would work in the real world, because obviously you can't spend gold coins very easily nowadays. It's just, I don't know, it's kind of cool. I liked it. So the afterlife here is largely based in Greek myth, with some Christian myth mixed in, because again, they have heaven and hell, and they're run by the Keeper of Heaven and the Keeper of Hell, who are pretty clearly meant to be Yahweh and Lucifer. Uh, and we, d we see them a little bit, but not a whole lot. And if you couldn't pick up on it all from all that, the fairies are led by somebody named the Charon. You know, that's not their name, that's their title. Like, as in Charon, the guy who led dead souls to the afterlife. He was the ferryman who brought dead souls into the afterlife in Greek myth. Although the audiobook narrator pronounces it as Karen for some reason, I, I do not know why. Everywhere else I've ever been, it's been pronounced Charon. But anyways, this world is pretty interesting. And in the first book, it is largely just about Eli meeting Casey and falling in love with her. And again, she is a fairy, so it kind of drags him into this world uh, of this crazy way of running the afterlife. And then we learn there's like a bigger conspiracy of people who are killing off people when they're not fated to die, which is a big no-no. It's like against treaties that the Kier and the uh, fairies have made over thousands of years. And they're also wondering, like, who could possibly be doing this? Because uh, if fate is not followed too much, then it can actually cause reality to unravel and bad things to happen. So no one wants this, including, like, Jason Moros, the millennia old god of death, and the fairies and the Kier. Like, nobody wants this. This is bad. And that's, like, the main story of the series. And while this series, the story for it overall is good, I did enjoy it, uh, it does have a big problem for me, and that's that it follows the romance series model, which I didn't know about until, like, last year when I read a series called Elemental, but apparently it's common in this genre. And basically what it is is that every book focuses on a different member of the main cast who finds love and then it shows them starting their relationship. And then after that's all done, they just get pushed to the side and they barely show up in the rest of the series. Like the first book, like I said, is about Eli and Casey. And then the other books are about a different member of the fairy family falling in love with somebody else. Like uh, the second book is about Galena, Eli's sister, and Declan, who is Casey's older brother. And they fall in love. And none of them ever mention that that's kind of weird. <laughs> you know, like, hey, we're blood-related and in-laws. Isn't that a little strange? Like, it'd be one thing if they brought it up and nobody thought too much of it. They're like, yeah, it's a little weird, but whatever. But they just never even mention it, which struck me as odd. Uh, and then the third book is about Ashlyn, who is Casey and Declan's older, older sister, uh, falling in love with Jason Moros, the millennia old god of death. And we will get to that more later. That I did not care for. But yeah, after reading two different series with this model, I gotta say I don't like it very much. Because in both cases, uh, the o older characters who I had gotten attached to with near the beginning or the middle of the series are just completely forgotten by the end of it, and they barely do anything. Like, they barely even get any appearances or lines of dialogue in the later books, and that is really, really upsetting. Uh, especially in the case of Eli, because Eli, I was really into his character in the first book. And by the end of it, which I'll get into in the spoiler section, don't worry, but by the end of it, his character arc was going in a really, really interesting direction. Like, I wanted to see where he would go with this next, and how he would adjust to, uh, to all these crazy events and how his life was changing going forward, but it just doesn't... It, it just never comes up again. Like, he just exists and pops up a few more times after that, and that's, that's it. It's a really big shame. And you can say the same about a couple of other characters who I kind of liked, but they just barely have anything to do by the climax, and that's... I just wasn't a fan, you know? I don't have a whole lot of deeper stuff to get into there. I just really don't like it when characters that I like are pushed to the side, and not because they, like, reach the end of their arc and there's not much else for them to do, or because they were killed off or anything, just the author didn't feel like putting them in. I, I don't like that. Now, I have a few more brief spots before I go into spoilers for all three of the main books. So, I did really like all the unique afterlife stuff. You know, seeing this setting, not only how Earth has changed and fallen to shit in uh, the next few decades, but also just seeing how the afterlife works, it, it's very unique, you know? Like, like I said, it's 
Greek and Christian mythology kind of mixed together, which is similar to what uh, her other series, Guards of the Shadowlands, did, where that one was largely Christian mythology, but mixed with, like, some Chinese folk religion ideas of the afterlife, like how there's a whole bunch of different hells that you go to depending on exactly what you did, as opposed to just one where they throw all the sinners, like in Christianity. You know, it's, it, it is kind of neat, and it, it is nice that uh, in both cases, these afterlifes feel very different from one another, but they also feel very different from the myths they're based on. You know, like, well, a couple weeks ago I did a video about how uh, using public domain just wholesale is not a good idea, and I mean this is this is how you use it properly. You know, you take inspiration from it and you mix it with some other stuff, and then you got something totally new. Like that's how you do it. I liked the romance in the first two books. Like we'll we'll get more into the third one in the spoiler section. Don't worry. But in the first two books, where it's uh, Eli and Casey and Galena and Declan. I thought the romances were handled well. You know, you can see these people get to know each other and get attached to one another, and they fight a little bit, but they also clearly care about each other. And just, you know, it, it works. It's kind of sweet to witness. However, in both cases, you have one interesting character and one really boring character. And in fact, that goes for the third book as well. <laughs> because in the first book, you have Eli, who is a really neat dude who has a pretty dark past, and we learn more about it as the book goes on. Uh, and we can see he's just trying to move on with his life and trying to start over and just really wants to protect his younger sister as well because she's been through some horrible things too. Uh, and he, he's great, but then Casey just is there. You know, like, the, there's nothing about her that's really bad or annoying, but she just sort of exists and is in the story and falls in love with him, and that's, that, that's all there is to it. There's not a whole lot else going on there. And then in the second book, we have Galena, who is very traumatized by some horrible stuff in her past, and she's trying to work past that. Uh, but also, she tries to look on the bright side of things. She's a very intelligent woman who sees the world in a unique way, and she really does genuinely want to help people by developing like vaccines and stuff and protecting them from disease. That's, that's wonderful. That's great. That's fantastic. And then Declan is there. You know? And... and that, that's it. And then the third book, again, it's Ashlyn, who is there, and Jason Moros, who is this millennia-old god of death, and he's... Again, I'll get more into it in spoilers. I don't think it's handled super well, but he is just more of an interesting character than her, because, again, he's a millennia-old god of death who is kind of yearning for some connection and also doesn't really want to be alive anymore. But yeah, no matter how well a romance is done, if only one side of it is any good on their own, then that drags the whole thing down. It's, it's upsetting. And finally, we get to the single biggest problem I have here, which is, like I mentioned, this is erotica, but even taking that into account, everyone here is just too freaking horny all the time. Like, constantly. I mean, I cannot emphasize to you just how constantly characters are thinking about and the narration is talking about dicks and boobies and butts and it, like, it's constant. Like, I don't know how else to describe it. Like, I don't want to uh, be getting into a dramatic scene and then all of a sudden there's an entire paragraph about how some dude's dick is getting hard and she can see the bulge through his pants or something. I'm like, okay, if you're going to put that in, there's a time and a place for it, and the time is not right in the middle of a dramatic scene. If you're going to have hardcore sex scenes, which this series does, they're, like, very X-rated, don't get me wrong, uh... And sometimes these scenes go on for more, more than one chapter, by the way. <laughs> like, I would rather, if you're going to do that, just be one really long chapter and not have it end, like, in mid-thrust, essentially. <laughs> and then it just continues on after that. It's, it's weird. I, I wasn't for that. But, yeah, like, characters being horny and everything, that's fine. But in moderation, man. <laughs> like, after a while, it, it, wouldn't it just be white noise, even if you are into it? Like, for me, it's just kind of annoying because I find it distracting while I'm reading, but I don't know. I don't like the way it's handled. Anyways, yeah, that, that's about it. Like, there's just constant talk about how horny characters are, and it goes on for all three books, and I did not like it at all. Uh, this other one is actually a problem that Elemental had as well. Like I said, I'm not a fan of the way these series are structured, and that's that the story is good, but it's all crammed into the climax of each book. You know, because... Uh, the majority of each book is really just focused on developing the romance there, which is fine, but then it's only like the last 
quarter of the book, maybe, where the actual plot gets moving and things change and things happen. So, like, the last quarter of the first book, the last quarter of the second book, and the third book, that one does have more stuff happening throughout, at least, but still, like, by focusing so much on the romance, it makes all the other stuff feel really crammed in, and it doesn't have the room to properly develop or grow. So that is... that that's just not great. And overall, weirdly enough, <laughs> I would say that overall this is just a sophomoric series. You know, it's immature, because it tries to deal with some heavy, heavy topics. Like, it tries to deal with moving past the death of a loved one, it deals with sexual violence, it deals with uh, horrible trauma that people have to deal with, it deals with you know, regular violence, <laughs> it deals with uh, how to try and live when the world's falling apart around you, it deals with the massive divide between rich and poor, and how the end of the world doesn't even really affect the rich that much, and it, it deals with all of them either very poorly or just on a bare surface level, so there's not that much to write home about about them, and I just wasn't a big fan of that. But then, it's kind of weird because Sarah Fine's other series that was written for teenagers is darker and more mature, <laughs> you know? Because Guards of the Shadowlands also deals with some really heavy topics. It deals with depression and suicide and sexual violence and moving past the death of a loved one and things like that. And it deals with them all in very complex, very interesting ways. Like, it goes deep into these topics, which is what you should do if you are dealing with these topics. I, I don't know, it's just odd to me that the same author can write something for teenagers and something for adults, and the thing for teenagers is way more mature and way better handled when it talks about serious subjects. So, I don't know. Like, would I really recommend uh, Servants of Fate to most people? No, not to most people, because if you're looking for, like, urban fantasy or something that sounds like this type of urban fantasy that you would like, then no, I feel like all the romance and erotica stuff would distract you. And if you're looking for just romance and erotica, maybe this will be something you'd enjoy, but also maybe the story would just be distracting. I I don't know, but that's, that's what it is. So uh, that's about it for non-spoilers, and let's go into spoilers now. I don't think I will ever get it. They betrayed me, they didn't keep their promise, they tricked me, and I don't care anymore. Okay, so I need to talk more about the first book, which is called Marked. And by the way, the books in this series have the most generic one-word titles. Like, the first book is Marked, the second one is uh, Claimed, and the third one is Faded. Which is not a good way to handle things. Like, if you're naming books in your series, don't just call them generic one-word titles, please, because it makes it not only hard to figure out what it's about and what it's going for, but also sometimes it makes it more likely that it shares a similar title with something else, like Marked is also the first book in the House of Night series, uh, and it makes it harder to remember. Like, I, I had to look at the names of the books in the series multiple times before I remembered which is which and in which order. It's like, it's just not good. Please don't do that. But anyways, in Marked, uh, like I said, that's Eli and Casey falling in love, I think that's handled fine overall. Like, they, their relationship is fine, and it's not unhealthy or anything. It's, it's, it's fine. I, I don't have a whole lot else to say. However, at the end, Eli dies, and he be, he's able to become a Kier. Like, Moros comes up to him and says, hey, I'll make you a Kier if you want, or you can just go to the afterlife. And I don't believe it's ever specified, but it's kind of implied that he might go to hell. <laughs> because, uh, and like I said earlier, you can only become a Kier if you have killed somebody before. And Eli has killed people, and at first people assume it's because he was in the military and he went off to war uh, years before the story began. Uh, but no, it turns out that several years before the story began, uh, when they were in Pittsburgh, he and Galena were walking home one night, and they got attacked by some men, and they beat up Eli really badly, and then they gang Galena. And obviously that was horrible and traumatic for both of them. And Galena doesn't know this, but Eli actually tracked down all those men and killed them all afterwards, which is understandable. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if I'd recommend that course of action, but it is understandable. And yeah, so because of that, he becomes a Kier. And how does he adjust to being a Kier? You know, I, I was thinking like the rest of the series would be about him trying to deal uh, with this huge... Uh, shift in his life and trying to deal with suddenly being immersed in this world of gods and demons and magic and stuff 
but that's that, that's just kind of it. You know, he, he's barely featured in the second and third books, and, well, that's annoying. You know, like I said, his arc just gets cut off in the middle. Then the second book, we have Galena and Declan, and this one is mostly about her trying to get over her trauma from, you know, again, being attacked by a group of men before. And I think that's mostly handled well. You know, like, th there is one part where Eli is trying to help her get over it, and he's just saying, hey, look, they're memories. Memories can't just hurt you. You remember what happened that night? And then he starts, like, going over the events in explicit detail, even while she's asking him to stop. And, uh, look, Eli, I know you mean well, and I'm no psychiatrist, but I don't think that's how you're supposed to handle that sort of thing. It, it, no, it's not good. And, um, basically, Galena is being targeted by whatever force is killing people uh, who are not fated to die, and whatever force that is is like trying specifically to cause chaos and to cause a bunch of disruption and things. And Galena is working on a vaccine that if it is properly developed, it will allow people to be immune to like all diseases. It, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense really, but okay, whatever, it's the future, there's magic and shit, whatever, we'll, we'll just roll with it. And so that's why they're trying to kill her because if she does that, then fewer people will die and there'll be less chaos. So her and Declan get married because if she becomes a member of the fairy family, then she not only gets super healing powers and lives longer, because fairies just live a long time, they're not normal humans, uh, but she also will not be able to be targeted by the Kier because there's a treaty that they've had in place for thousands of years. So, you know, this is beneficial for her. However, in order to become a full fairy, there are two things you have to do. Number one, you have to go through the marriage ceremony, which her and Declan do without any trouble. And number two, they have to have sex. But they can't just have sex. Galena has to climax <laughs> during it. And she has trouble doing that because of, you know, the thing that happened. So a huge chunk of the book is just dedicated to these characters need to have sex, but they can't. And... The fact that that's a major plot point is just eye-rolling. It's stupid. <laughs> I didn't like it. And they they do eventually... A, Galena does eventually work through it near the end, and she has sex with Declan, and it works out great. But the thing is, when she's working through it, she also is, like, describing the events of that night in extreme detail. And it's described in a way which is clearly meant to be kind of titillating. And I didn't like that because, look... If you're gonna have, like, some fantasy about non-consensual stuff thrown in there, then sure, you can do that. I'm not saying you're a bad person for doing that or anything, but it doesn't really work when you spent the better part of two books explaining how horrifying and traumatic it was for the person on the receiving end of it. Like, it's, it's much harder to separate fantasy from the reality of what that sort of thing would be like even if you are somebody who's into that sort of thing, which I'm personally not, but I can't imagine it would be super easy to do. And then the third book is Ashlyn and Moros falling in love, and honestly, just why? You know, Ashlyn, like I said, is not a very interesting character, and she's been just kind of a nothing presence in the series up until this point. And Moros is... I, I kind of liked him up until this point, but he's been this mysterious, powerful figure. Because again, he's a millennia-old god of death. He's been around a long, long time, and he's just unfathomably powerful compared to all the regular people around him. And we don't even know exactly uh, how much he knows and what exactly he can do, but he is just this weird presence in the story. And him being humanized just makes him worse of a character. You know, like, I'm not saying you can't do that, but just the way it was done here, I, I didn't like it, you know? And there was effort put in, you know? It, it shows his tortured relationship with his siblings, like the fates and some other gods who have, like, faded away into abstraction, as it's referred to as. Like, their power's there, they just don't have a conscious form. And, like, his mother is gone, and he, he's just lonely and searching for connection, basically, which is why he and Ashlyn get along. Uh, but then, because he's basically the protagonist of the last book, he gets to be the hero at the end, which sucks. You know, like... Uh, the god of chaos, who is just called Chaos, is coming in and is gonna, like, destroy a bunch of stuff and destroy fate and make the world fall into even more shit than it already is, and Moros is the one who gets to kill him, and he just, 
I, I don't know. Like, it's weird that this guy who seemed... Like, he's just a side character for most of the series, and then he comes out and gets to be the hero. You know, like, I mentioned the Elemental series before, and that one, every book focuses on a different character, but in at the end, at the climax of the whole series, they all come together and work together in order to save the day. So that worked, but here it, it just doesn't. I don't know, the, the story of all three of these books is just so different. You know, they're so different in what they're about and what they deal with that at times they don't even seem like they're in the same series. <laughs> and, like, alone they're all fine. Like, uh, the first book is about a man finding out about this magical world, being immersed in it, falling in love, becoming a weird demon spirit thing and having to adjust to that. Then the second book is about getting over horrible trauma while also running for your life from forces that are out to get you. And the third book is about this god of death who is becoming a bit more human. Like, all those are fine, but when you put them all in the same series, it just robs all the books of their identity. You know, like, there's nothing that ties all this together. There, there's nothing I can say about this series uh, that would bring it all in together and allow me to just say, like, yep, I liked it because X, or I liked it because Y, or disliked it because Y, or anything like that. It's just... It, it just feels like they took three very different books and tried to tie them together very clumsily. And, I don't know, like, like I said, uh, there's not a lot here that would appeal to people other than the neat world building and the sex scenes. So, just, uh, how do I even end this? <laughs> I, I don't know. But, that's all. Thanks for watching. Goodbye. Wow, you, you're still watching? I... I mean, I guess I appreciate it, but I'm not sure why. I mean, at this point, all that we have left is all these names here. These are my patrons, and including my $10 and up patrons. Apo Savalainen, Olivia Rayan, Brother Santodes, Buffy Valentine, Carolina Clay, Dan Antselievich, Dark King, Dawn, Dio, Echo, Flax, Karkat Kitsune, Lexi Delorme, Liza Rudakova, Lord Tiebreaker, Micaphone, Mistboy, Peep the Toad, Roby Reviews, Sad Mardigan, Sillier the Vixen, Stone Stairs, Tesla Shark, Ve Victus, and Wesley. These are all great people, you know? Let me, let me just, let me tell you. If you want to get your name on here, then consider donating to me once a month. Become a patron. Or if you don't feel like doing that, or you just can't because, you know, you're like poor or whatever no shame in that uh then just you know rate the video comment on it subscribe share it around spam it to all your friends and uh yeah goodbye